Great. Well, um, Kim and possibly Genevieve are going to pop in, but we'll get started on um, the idea of, um, so the idea came up because I was actually talking to Allegra uh, about a client who came in, a new client, and she said, you know, I've encouraged people in our kind of rehab course, actually, to ask the question, does your back ever go out? And um, to take that yes, if they say yes, because you'll hear people say that all the time, my back goes out once in a while, it's not a big deal. But actually, it is kind of a big deal, I think, if somebody's back goes out. And, and the hard part is, is, what does that actually mean? What happens when somebody's back goes out? Um, so I wanted to sort of present that. And, 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 Um, the idea of the back going out, it can be a number of things. The first thing, so the first thing to consider is sort of the age of the patient, right? The client, the patient. Um, how old were they when this happened? What is the circumstance? If the circumstance, like I can give you um, a good example, is a young person carrying heavy things, um, has not ever had any situation with back pain before. Um, and that young person does a lot of work one day, wakes up the next day and can't move, right? Feels really stiff, feels really sore, feels like they can't stand up straight. That could be back going out. Um, chances are in that case, if it's not severe and not local, uh, not very localized kind of across the back, that that could topics on the spine. So we can also go over those but as in any other part of the body. I say just the muscle spasm, but just the muscle spasm is really painful, right? You guys have had those cramps in your legs in the middle of the night with a calf, right? Now tell me that you've all felt that, right? So that calf cramp wakes you up. It's serious and you got to get up and get that calf stretched out. Well, imagine that happening in your back, right? Now that's, and it's the middle of your body, and it's really a lot harder to stretch out than just your calf because your calf, you just flex the foot. You force that flexed foot and you get, um, you get the muscle to lengthen, which is why it relaxes, right? It's a lot harder to do a Charlie horse in the middle of your back. Um, that could be a muscle spasm, right? That can knock you down, right? You can't get up, you feel stuck, you're in pain, right? So that amount of pain centralized so that, that could be one scenario. The question that I always think about is why? Why did the back spasm, right? So if it's lifting heavy things one day, you go to bed at night, your muscles freak out overnight. <laughs> like if you ran on your tippy toes up a hill, that's your calf cramp, right? Maybe that's kind of the workout you did for your back the day before you wake up with that. And over the time, over the day, it starts to work its way out. And that's more likely a muscle spasm. If, um, on the other hand, you bend down, for example, to fix something up, and the mechanism or the motion is forward flexion with a little bit of a rotation, which it often is. So the, the in my history of PT, the ones I can think of like that are, um, I was working with a woman who had a desk job. She was seated in her chair and a lot of her work was bending over the chair to file something in the drawer below, right? So she would take papers from one side, turn while seated and put them in the file drawer on the other side below her, right? So that mechanism is a loaded flexion rotation. And you, you was in class, oh, actually, um, if you had, if you'd been in class yesterday, you would have heard me say that that motion of, um, welcome Kim, that motion of um, taking that from one side, seated, loaded, rotating down in the other, what does that make you think of then? Anyone have any ideas? What does that make you think of? What, what, what happens a lot with loaded flexion and rotation? Do you guys know? What can go wrong? Any thoughts? The, something with the disc or? Just... Yes, exactly. Yeah. Something with the disc. That's exactly how the disc can get upset is with that kind of 
loaded flexion rotation. So even though if we think of a paper file, right, that's not very heavy, it's still that action of the load and the flexion rotation that could happen in an instant, in a single, single instance, or it could happen like with this woman, it was just repetitive action over and over with a loaded flexion rotation. So I think in, in her case, uh, that might have been what caused it. And so if you think that it could be that, um, I'm gonna, Genevieve, I'm just gonna mute your thing because I'm echoing a little bit. There we go. Um, so with that loaded flexion rotation over time, repetitive motion, I think maybe the disc started to move out of position. So in that case, um, I would say that that might be a disc injury. The third scenario of why the back might potentially go out could be a facet joint issue. And that could be more from like an, that would be more an extension based issue. So, and if you think about those facet joints, right, they're the, where the one vertebra above seats on the one vertebra below, right? So we have the facet joint on every vertebra at the bottom of the vertebra and at the top of the vertebra and they come together. So it could be that um, something goes wrong alignment wise um, and the facet joint doesn't sit just right or gets stuck over a little bit. And in that case, the, the person's gonna not be able to straighten up all the way or rotate to one side typically is what happens there. And so that's the um, kind of that rotation Extension with rotation can get you there or a rotational activity could get you there where um, not so much of the loaded flexion, it wouldn't be, that wouldn't have been the mechanism. It would have been maybe running, um, jumping, jogging, doing something in CrossFit. That's a great way to get into the, that. All of those scenarios, right? So either just the muscle spasm or the disc or the facet joint will cause muscles to freak out, right? So that's the why of why we might Charlie horse in our back or muscle spasm in our back is if something there is not right, the muscles are gonna grab and guard. And that muscle grabbing and guarding is often more painful than the actual incident. So if it, with a disc, if it's just a little bulge and it's not hitting a nerve, that's not gonna be the disc itself, bulging a tiny bit, not hitting the nerve is not that painful in and of itself but the whole system gets upset and angry and the muscles spasm and freak out and that becomes really painful. And that's what holds the body still. It's the body's protective way of saying, don't move, something's wrong, don't move, right? So in, in the disc situation, it might be helping that disc not go any further, not letting you do that action anymore, is not letting that disc bulge out any further or not letting it herniate. In the, in the place of the facet joint, if that was to move and you get stuck, uh, then that muscle spasm is actually holding you probably in the wrong place. So unwinding that muscle spasm becomes a really hard task, but a necessary task in order to relieve the issue or the problem. Uh, so three scenarios of why a back might go out. And, and then here's, here's the thing. If somebody's back goes out once in their young age, that happens to a lot of people. Uh, they might be fine for the rest of their lives, especially if it was like an, an accidental, incidental thing one time and they've not had any symptoms again. But typically what we hear is that they have had 50% of people, 50% of people or so have a recurrence. If it's a disc, they're going to have a recurrence of that disc bulging or movement and causing that back to go out. After the second time, it's something crazy like 85% of people have a recurrence after that, after the third time it does it. So uh, as the more time somebody's back has gone out in their lives, the more likely their back is to go out. So the question then becomes, what do we do with that information? Does that, Allegra, first I should ask you, because you're the one who posed that question, does that help clarify what it means if a back goes out? Yeah. Yeah, it, it does. Because I, I, it's never happened to me. I mean, thank goodness, but I've heard people, you know, just speak about it. You know, like I was saying like, Oh, like my back got thrown out. Like, or I threw my back out kind of like a, like, Oh, I have a headache. And, um, it's, yeah, it totally makes sense. You know, there can be a difference. So I didn't realize it was so painful, like a Charlie horse. That sounds horrible. 
So, um, yeah, yeah it sounds, I want to do everything to protect myself for me and my clients. <laughs> too. But yeah, yeah. Thank you. yeah, usually, usually what they'll say is that I couldn't move at first for a day or two, and then I could start to move a little bit more and start to work itself out. And that's really typical of a muscle spasm. Where that's not the case is when, say it's a disc herniation, then the nucleus of the disc has been damaged to some extent. And usually that presents as nerve pain, right? And that nerve pain is going way down the leg. Um, a lot of the times, super painful, can't sleep at night, can't get comfortable. And the pain is really, really painful. Actually, we had a client recently who was having um, just nerve compression. It wasn't disc related, but it was just nerve compression and that nerve compression pain or nerves having that disc acid come out on them are not happy nerves. It's a, that's really a, a whole nother level. Um, but I think when people casually talk about their back going out, it's one of those things and it can keep them out. Some people will say, yeah, I laid in bed for three days. I couldn't move. You know, um, I actually think that's the wrong approach most of the time uh, because then the muscles just stay tight, right? If you had a Charlie horse in your calf and you just laid there with that Charlie horse, it's going to get, it, right, <laughs> Kim's face, oh, right? It's going to stay in your leg until you stretch that Charlie horse out, right? You would never just lay there. Or if you're swimming, oh my gosh, have you had this happen in the pool? Swimming, I, oh my gosh, and I've had to get out of the pool. But if I had to stay there with that Charlie horse in my foot, like that is so terribly painful. So if you get a Charlie horse in your back and you just lay there for three days, wow, it takes that long for that Charlie horse to work its way out. I'd rather try and work it out myself with very gentle movements, right? Gentle, careful, graded, unloaded um, movements. I would rather work that out, right? Than sit there with the Charlie horse for three days. But um, the point is that if somebody, so on the intake form, right? I love to ask that question or in that first session, does your back ever go out? Oh yeah, it happened 20 years ago. I've had that happen, but it's never happened since. And I was young, I was playing football. I was lifting scuba tanks. I was, you know, something crazy and it happened. Um, and it's never happened since. Okay, that, that, depending on how old they are, right? That might be like a one-time deal. But most of the time, what I hear is, yeah, yeah, you know, my back goes out once, once in a while. And then when you ask, start asking questions, well, what's once in a while? Oh, it goes out, you know, like once or twice a month. Yikes, right? So you, yikes, that's going to happen again. So what do we do with that information? What would you do with that information then? Probably. Uh Ask them what, ask them what kind of movements they are doing and what, I guess, what kind of situation would bring it on. Yeah. And then I would, I would contact you for uh, <laughs> guidance. <laughs> that's cheating. Okay. So, uh, okay. I think that's a great start, right? Asking them if they know what, what happened, what happened just before you had your back went out. They might say, I have no idea what causes it. So you could be a little bit of a detective and say, what happened just before it went out, right? And, and if they said, um, I woke up with it, then what, what, then what could you ask? What position do you sleep in? Potentially, or even, what do we know about disc pain? Does it happen in the moment? Or does it happen the next day? Oh, uh, uh, no, <clears throat> no, it's delayed. It's delayed. So, so then your question might be, sure, what position did you sleep in? But oh, I would even- Yesterday. What were you doing the day before? Yes. What were you doing the day before? Did you do anything new? Did you, and a lot of times I'll get, no, not really, except I spent four hours gardening. <laughs> you guys have gardened like gardening is no light task they're squatting they're kneeling they're lifting heavy bags of dirt they're filling pots they're bending over all the time digging right so gardening is no easy task or I hear this oh I just played a round of tennis with my kid what's tennis it's all rotation Right. That might not tell you if it's disc or not, but definitely rotation can cause disc. It can definitely cause facet joint issues. Right. 
So, and the thing about disc pain, right, is it's that it's usually latent. It can be latent, meaning it can happen 24, even 48 hours after whatever it was that set it off. Whereas facet joint pain tends to be really closely immediate. So sometimes that's more likely to be, well, it could be either really disc, disc you could feel in the moment, depending on how severe it is, but um, facet joint usually is not happening the next day. It's happening on that spot uh, at the day and the time. So if something goes wrong at that day and time, you would, uh, could rule in either facet joint or disc, but if it's happening the next day, you can likely rule out that it's a facet joint, right? If they're not feeling pain till the next day, probably not that facet joint. It's more likely on the disc side or muscle spasm without disc, or sometimes the disc moves out a little and you go into spasm and then it moves back in. Like it just moves too much. And the last case scenario that I didn't bring up is that they're unstable. Right. So the people, people, some people with unstable spines who have a little bit of a sliding happening, um, which would be your hypermobile population, your gymnast or your past gymnast. Sometimes the vertebra slide a little bit and that sliding can cause the muscles to freak out and spasm as well. So then you could have the back going out because there's too much motion there. But in all of these cases, right, if knowing, keeping in mind, if all you knew was that the recurrence rate, if it's a disc, is 50% if it's happened once and 80 something percent if it's happened twice for it to happen a third time. What are you gonna do in studio with that person? Yeah, get them um, doing the, the proper exercises for what's going on with them, you know, disc versus uh, the set. And um, yeah, just get them, get them really stable, get them strong. Mm -hmm. So what if you don't know, if you don't know if it's disc or facet, then you go with that idea of stability, right? Mm -hmm. So you're absolutely right, Allegra. Stability is key, right? So you'll stabilize and, um, and then see how it goes. And if you're not sure, you keep asking questions. Um, and then if it happens while they're not with you, but while you're, they're one of your clients, Again, that might be a good chance to do a little investigation, have them see a doctor, have them see a physical therapist, have them see somebody so that then you can kind of figure out, especially if it feels like the same thing happened again type of deal. Oh yeah, here it goes again. That's my back thing that happens. Then it might be worth having them do a little investigation to try and figure out what it is at that point so that you have a better idea of what you can do um, to, help, to help them get better and maybe not have it happen again. Right. So, so that would be kind of when I hear that though, it's definitely an alarm. I'm definitely not doing any loaded flexion. Uh, extension is not as scary to be honest as loaded flexion to me, because if it's a facet joint that's, that went wrong, uh, the symptoms would be they can't, even after the pain fades away, and this might be a way to kind of assess too, even after the pain fades away, they still would have trouble, maybe discomfort in extension and rotation and or rotation to one side is usually what they feel. So if that's the case after the fact, you might think, okay, that might be facet joint. Um, I still probably wouldn't do the loaded flexion with them. I would still work on mobility, lengthening, maybe side bending away, um, things like that, not really loading it, but you uh, might have more of a, an idea if that's what they're left with, is that extension pain. But you can do extension work without really feeling like you're gonna hurt them for tomorrow, right? With the disc, if you do loaded flexion, they won't feel pain in the moment and then the next day they're all flared up, right? With a uh, facet joint, they'll tell you right there and then as you extend, as they go into extension, this feels bad, this hurts. I can't extend, I feel blocked. Um, this is bringing my symptoms on, right? So they will tell you in that moment. And then as long as you don't repeat that motion a lot, they'll probably be just fine. Yeah, so you don't have to worry about introducing extension as much as you need to worry about loaded flexion. Yeah. Um, so that being said, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I was thinking about, um, 
I guess my client, um, you know, her back went out when was Kauda a client. when, you know, sometimes to get a back stretch, you know, people want to go into the child's pose and like totally just like extend the back. And she's like, I'm like, no, no, no. Like, let's do this. Like more of a, a rounded spine. And she's like, but it feels so much better the other way. And I'm like, well, what about, you know, so I had her move back a little bit on her hips because, you know, she was going to be in pain the next day if we do that, but she just didn't, you know, know at that point. And, you know, it's just, I think, you know, something simple like that, it, it, it could just seem so natural to them where they might not be aware of it. So I think, yeah, the education of, you know, telling them, well, you know, even if you're doing this at home, this might be something that could, you know, it is hurting you, you know, yeah. it's just not great for you. Yeah. Yeah. So the extension in Kadequina is the one to watch out for. Yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah. So, and sometimes you're right. People don't realize that what they're, what feels good in the moment is what's actually aggravating. And with nerves, it's a little harder to, to connect the dots. Yeah. So it is, it is good to, you know, if, if they're in that moment, knowing what the diagnosis is would be helpful. So that's why, you know, if, if they're having an episode, it's worth maybe sometimes getting someone who can actually diagnose it to take a look at it and see what exactly goes wrong. And then how, how much longer, um, do, I mean, how long does someone want to wait before they go to start doing Pilates, uh, you know, after they've had an episode like this? So one of the most frustrating things, um, for me, I mean, granted, um, more physical on the more physical therapy side is when people call me and say, oh, my back is hurting a lot today. So I'm not going to come in to physical therapy. Whereas it really, in my opinion, should be the opposite way around, right? If your back's hurting more, that's the day you really do want to come into physical therapy, not the day that you don't. Granted, Pilates is a little bit different, but I think in, in the rehab setting where we are all working, uh, you, I think it's good to have them come in if they can. And then what you're going to work on is unloading. So what exercise, let's just go through maybe a list of exercises that could really be helpful in unloading the spine. Coccyx curl. Coccyx bridging. curl potentially, low bridging potentially, right? So we're thinking of, you're thinking of lengthening the spine, right? Things that lengthen the spine. Yeah. Um, in in Knees studio, over bar. Exactly. In studio, that is absolutely one of my favorites, knees over bar. And the one that I don't use oh. as often, but wish I did use more was the knees over bar in reverse, meaning their feet are towards the springboard or the tower instead of their head and their knees are over bar. That actually can also lengthen even more. But yeah, so knees over bar and then the breathing with the rollback bar with the feet in the trapeze with the lap pulls. That's a great way to also open up. Um, by the way, just, to, just an aside, I knew this comes from the, the test that we did is the lot is breathing. You guys know what I saying, what I mean when I say breathing with rollback bar, right? Feet in the trapeze, holding onto the bar, a lot pulling down. So that one, um, is what do you yes. think about the arms? Yeah. So arms, the arm part does it make a difference if you're doing the arms or not and why? What do you guys think? Kim's nodding her head. Yes, it makes a difference. Oh, I definitely think it makes a difference. Um, it's yeah. a lot more activation all the way up the, the back, the chain, the back side, the posterior chain. That's yeah. I try to get people to connect in their laps. Thank you. Hands down gently. And then lift up. And I've a couple of times I've, or of course more than a couple of times probably I've kind of forgotten about the arms and people or people get used to doing it and so they don't grab the bar and they just come up and down. And then it just really becomes a lot more like bridging than it does the the back stretching that we're trying to get. Mm -hmm. And thank you, that's great. And what is why is that? You Kim said the muscle name that we're after. The lats. The lats. Yeah. So we're making a connection with the lat, but why, why does the lat work that way? Do you guys remember the attachment points of the lats? <laughs> I 
it's the humorous right. to the low spine. Humorous, right to the thoracolumbar fascia, exactly, you, which goes right to the iliac crest. Yeah. So it is all the way arm to pelvis. Yeah. So it crosses and it's diagonal fibers um, coming through under the arm. So with that lat pull, you're really creating more length, more stretch, more connection, and more opening through that whole posterior chain, right? Without the lat pull, you lose a lot of that lengthening that you get by engaging the lats. So it's really, um, it's really helpful. It makes a big difference, in my opinion, to have the arms going there on the breathing with roll back bar, so feet and trapeze, lat pulls. Um, I think it makes a huge difference. You should try it if you haven't felt it in a while. Go back and try it without arms and then try it with arms, even without a spotter giving you a little traction on the feet. Try it and see, you'll feel the difference. Yeah, you'll really feel how much of a difference that lot connection can make um, or not having it. It's really hard to, it really, the bar really helps give that connection. So you get a little bit more out of it. Yeah. So, yeah, so we're talking about exercise at length and quadruped is always a good option. If they can quadruped, that's always a good option for relieving symptoms. So it's kind of that unloaded position. So I have a little story I'll interject here. My, we went, um, oh, several years, maybe seven or eight years ago. We went on a trip with my whole family, 14 of us to Mexico with little tiny kids at the time. And we took them to um, this water park, safari type place. And we came tubing down the water in these big tubes and then you, climb up on this dock and you there's this rope obstacle course hanging over the water and so we were messing around from the tubes to this thing and my sister pushed up to get on the dock you did like kind of climb out of the water onto this dock and she had a back spasm uh, she never had one before couldn't get off the, couldn't move like she was stuck on the edge of the dock and so she's like what do I do what do I do I'm like okay first we breathe first we breathe right breathing is always good because what's happening in that moment, right? That's that muscle spasm in that moment. So that really grabbing, tightening, Charlie hoisting happening. And the more you panic, and this is, sometimes I have a really hard time explaining this to clients, uh, but the more tension they put around or the more fear they put around that pain, the harder it is for that pain to unwind. So I was like, first we breathe, we just breathe. And then we're gonna crawl out on all fours and roll onto your back, side back. And that's going to hurt because she's stuck, right? And frozen. But I got her onto her back for a moment on the edge of this dock, people climbing over her in and out of the water, <laughs> poor thing, in her bathing, in our bathing suits. Like it's such so, the wrong place to have this happen. <laughs> and we got her laying, hook laying, breathing. So that would be step one, right? She And she could relax a little bit there. She didn't feel the pain so intensely there. We could breathe into those muscles. And then we got from there, the transition is always hard, but we could go there to all fours, right? All fours is really unloaded position also. So if we're going to go from one unloaded, which would be sort of that on your back 90, 90, to then all fours would be the next unloaded position. It's when you try and bring the torso up against gravity that you start getting more pressure and the muscles want to grab again. So you could definitely work somebody on all fours. You could work on kind of that cat idea. You could do just, I probably, I don't really, I actually don't use the cow part as much. Um, maybe that's a mistake for some things, but I find that just the rounding opens and stretches the back muscles when I'm trying to stretch them. And then the dropping in when they're sensitive can make things want to tighten a little bit on top. So I tend to do that. And then we could go little cat into coccyx curl, right? So coming from all fours lifted, and then rocking back into a little bit of a child's pose direction. Um, so we got her there. We basically had her crawl up and lay down on the side. when <laughs> We got her safe. And then we could get her up from there to, we avoided sitting for sure, because that's always loading. That's actually one of the most loaded places you could possibly be is sitting. And so we went from kneeling to standing and walking. And then we put her back in the water, which was actually better. Uh, unloaded a little bit. Yeah. So those are some things you could think about in terms of from the supine position with legs supported to quadruped position um, to things that create length and space and avoid sitting 
really, and go to standing and trying to get some motion in walking. And trying to get that upright posture in walking is really good. Sometimes even just taking the thumbs and sticking them in the back body. Let me show you. So sometimes even just taking the thumbs, sticking them right into the back here and lifting upward can really help somebody get from this getting from the spec position forward here to that upward. I can get the thumbs in sometimes and really help them lift. So tell coach them to put their thumbs in and try and stretch over the thumbs. Yeah, sometimes that will just help. They'll help them find the butt forward and then help them bring the torso back a little bit. Um, especially if it's a facet issue that really can help pressing that those vertebrae or the sore spot forward into their back can actually really help to it sometimes. So those are just some suggestions to get started. Uh, so you could think of any exercises that do that. You could get a little core stability going, breathing, a little predict the load maybe, legs and tabletop, things like that, that um, maybe even supported hands behind the legs, right? And then on the equipment, getting things that feel comfortable to them where they feel really supported. So things what they're working in supine a lot of the time, yeah? So how would, um, so I'm just trying to visualize it in my head. So you get, you get them to supine, then you get them to quadruped, trying to, um, you know, getting some more unloading there. You say not to go to sitting. So how would you get them from quadruped to standing? What position would, would you yeah, like? You can oh, definitely uh, say that again. Oh, no, I was just wondering. I was just trying oh, to think. Yeah. You know, yeah. So. Squat. Yeah, you can go from here, right? This could be the position where you try and get them upright from rather than flipping around to sitting. So I was talking about lifting belly right here and then shifting back to open up as much as they could and then coming forward. So from here, I would probably do the work of bringing the leg up, pressing on coming up here, yeah? And then that would be my transition up to standing and they may need to hold on to something or push down on something usually feels good or if there's nothing around them, you can push down on the thigh to come up. But that from here right up to standing is much better than trying to sit. Yeah, even if they have to kind of do it this way and get up kind of with a bent back and then work to straighten themselves out once they get onto their feet, that's actually better, I think, than trying to go through a sitting position. Yeah, when they're really acute. But in the case of somebody coming in, so we'll revert back to the original question, which was a new client comes in, she's coming in to strengthen. Uh, and in the process of the interview with the client, she says, oh yeah, my back goes out once in a while. Uh, I, I don't even know how often, but once every three months I have a back injury, or three times a year, my back goes out kind of a thing. So how does that change what you would do with the client in studio, right? That does make a difference for us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and if you yeah, don't know totally. what causes it, yeah, right? If you don't know what causes it, that just makes me, uh, then in my head, I'm not, I'm putting her on the back safe repertoire and I'm not loading inflection. And if she tells me it hurts when she extends, I'm gonna be really careful about extension too. I work on thoracic extension without lumbar extension if that's the place, you know, where the pain is. Or sort of, you'll, you'll get to know the client and know where that pain comes in, in extension, if it's there. And then if, if there is an incident, it luck hopefully will not be because of what she does with you, but then I would encourage her to get a little bit of investigation done to try and figure out what is going on, right? So you can help prevent it. But a lot of times, if you can keep her safe while, while she's working, then by the, then those incidents tend to not happen as often, right? And there is a lot of research out there showing that just the core stabilization exercises can really help decrease the amount of recurrence of back problems. So hopefully by working with you, she won't have that episode every three months. She'll maybe have an episode in six months and it won't be as severe. And then she'll have an episode maybe 12 months later, but again, not very severe. And then she just doesn't have those episodes. That would be fantastic, right? That would be our goal. Sure. Someone came in the other day, a new client, and 
she told me that she had herniated her L her a disc in the lumbar spine uh, doing Pilates, not here, of course, but it was about, um, she said five or six years ago, and she'd been petrified to come in and come back to Pilates because of that um, mm. situation. So mm -hmm. six years ago, I mean, I kept her, of course, I kept her in a back safe. She, she's not been exercising either. So, you know, I just kept it, kept it simple. But do we need to worry about something that happened six years ago? I thought probably she'd be more prone to having it again if she'd had it once. Yeah. So thank you, Kim, for bringing that up. Yeah. If she's had, first of all, I think just let's think about the difference between a disc herniation and a disc bulge again, just to really clarify. The disc bulge means the disc just moved a little out of position. And a lot of times that disc can reduce into position. And there isn't a lot of, usually, unless it's happened a lot of times, but th that disc might still be in really good shape with a disc bulge. But what the alarm bell there with that disc bulge is, it's moving. It moved once, it can maybe move again, which means that those ligaments that usually hold it in place aren't doing their job as well as they could be. Um, or the muscles aren't doing their job as well as they could be around that area. And we just don't want to be the cause of it happening again. Right. But the disc itself is probably still pretty healthy, pretty juicy. Everything's like the cartilage is healthy with a disc herniation. The difference is I like to think of it as a little bubble, the nucleus of the disc being a little bubble inside the annulus, the annulus are those outer rings, the nucleus, the center ring. And what you want to think of is either that disc with a herniate, that nucleus with that herniation got so much pressure that a little, that it either popped or there's a little seeping puncture in it, like a needle point puncture in it. And some of that fluid is gotten out of there. So a herniated disc typically doesn't have the beautiful structure still that our discs like to have. So you could imagine that a herniated disc six years ago ha probably has a little less disc height already. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if it was a disc herniation, I would probably never load her in flexion. And I would probably to advise her never to exercise in loaded flexion because it's not necessary. Yeah. So, um, and then something else that I was telling the class this week, actually, the rehab classes, the thing is, is we know what the whole Pilates repertoire has in it, right? We've studied it. We know all the exercises in the repertoire, but somebody coming in to see us, they have no idea what all the exercises in the Pilates repertoire are. So they don't have, you don't have to do loaded flexion exercises with them and they don't know that they're missing anything especially if you give them a good class or a good session, it's no different mm -hmm. to them, whether they're rolling up and down their spine or they're doing the fives with intensity, right? That are safe. They, for them, it's the same thing. It's still Pilates. It's still classic in nature. It's still a great workout for their core, but we're not putting them in danger and they have no idea what they're missing, right? What they're missing. I say, I say they're not really missing it because it's not great for their body, right? But they have no idea that they're not getting this full repertoire. And if they ask, you can say, sure, we've modified. I say all the time, yeah, we've modified the repertoire to keep it safe for people with back injuries. Um, but we have a great flow in our classes. It's a great class. You're getting a great workout. They don't care, right? They don't care that you're not doing something. So keep that in mind. You know, we know sometimes when you know too much, it's hard to hold back and think, oh, I'm not giving them the full Pilates repertoire. Well, no, but I, I don't give anybody the full Pilates repertoire because I don't feel like the full Pilates repertoire is appropriate for everybody, right? Everybody, I should say. <laughs> yeah. So thanks for bringing that up, Kim. Yeah. Six years disc herniation, I'd say let's not load inflection. Why? It, they're they're going to load inflection in their lives outside of the studio. So I'm going to let them, I'm going to strengthen that and let them take their loaded flexion chances outside of the studio. Not, not under my roof. That's how I feel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause of course, one of the things that she said to me was something about, well, I really wanted to do yoga, but you know, and she demonstrated doing a forward fold and I was like, don't do that. <laughs> so, yes. So. Yeah. 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 Anyway. Yeah. So yeah. Just, 
Um, getting back to the original, you know, the client who threw her back out. Um, so I really need to get some more information about why or how she threw her back out or if she knows what happened specifically so I can, it doesn't happen when I'm with her in the session, obviously, or, you know, maybe afterwards or something. Yeah. Like yeah. So this would be somebody, you maybe don't need to get that information right away because mm -hmm. really she needs to just get stronger. And I think her primary complaint is hip, right? It was a hip mm -hmm. issue more than a back issue. So she wasn't even really coming in because of the back. Right. So yeah. I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't really put too much weight on it in, in front of her. Mm -hmm. Other than in, in your mind, I would be thinking about how I can, the, the things I would be thinking about is I need to stabilize. I need to open up that hip, but, but that back going out gives you a lot of information about the hip too, which I'll touch on in a minute. But what you're thinking about is I need to help this woman with her hip. I'm going to work towards hip. And in the process, I'm just going to keep her back stable and help her strengthen that and stabilize her back. And I'm not going to load her in flexion. And if we get into a position where she's feeling discomfort, I'll just keep her like keep discomfort in extension. I'm going to make sure that I ask her questions when we get to extension, make sure she's not feeling any discomfort, make sure that she, I always ask when they come in the next session, how did you feel after our, our last session that evening or the next day, everything fine. Yeah. Yeah. All fine. You know, so you can really know uh, that what you did was fine and wasn't bothersome. And then down the road, I would start maybe asking a little bit more questions, but, but here's some food for thought, right? Uh, if somebody comes in, has a hip issue and they've had their back going out, it might be worth asking or maybe worth wondering, it, could there be a connection between the hip and that back? Could there be? So if there's hip dysfunction, what is something that you commonly see with somebody with hip dysfunction, hip pain? What do you see that they change with their patterns? Their gait pattern? Their gait, exactly. And what do they change about their gait pattern? They might favor one side maybe, or? Okay, great. They could favor one side. So they could not put as much weight on one side. That would be one way to modify. Great, okay. what's another? Shorter, shorter um, strides, or they might be hinging, bending a little bit forward, or some mm -hmm. strange way. Oh yeah, great. So great, they could be bending forward. They could be not striding equally. And what part of the stride gets left out when somebody has hip pain? Typically, the swing. The swing. Right, they don't extend the hip. Oh, or yeah. in an athlete, which is the scenario that Allegra is dealing with, she's an athlete or was an athlete doing a lot of CrossFit, right? She was doing a lot of heavy weight stuff. She was doing a lot of lunging work. And perhaps when you're working out hard and when you're really strong, you get tight. So perhaps her hip didn't have enough extension because she was tight. What happens if you want to walk, you don't have enough hip extension, but you know you need to keep your torso upright. Where does that extension go? Oh, your lower back? Your lower back, right? This happens in runners a lot, right? They get tight because they run a lot and they run up, especially runners that run uphill. They get tight. Their hips don't extend because they're so tight. And so, but they have to get extension. So the extension starts to happen in the lower back. So with every running step or every big running step, instead of hip, hip extension, they get low back extension because you, they've got to get that extension in the running stride somewhere. So over time, if every time I need to extend, I'm extending here instead of just extending here, right? I could cause a back issue. And if I was doing lunges over and over repetitive lunges, and I had a hip problem, but I wanna keep my torso upright and I'm holding weight while I'm doing it. Where am I gonna get that torso? Uh, how am I gonna get that torso up? If, if I take my hip back, cause it's tight, it might naturally, I can't get the hip back, but I need to get my torso up. So then I'm gonna go this way, right? That's not really hip extension so much. That's back extension, right? 
So there may be a connection between hip pain and back pain if hip was tight initially, so she was taking it into her back, or if the back wasn't stable enough and she took a lot of load in her hip, it could happen the other way, or it could be psoas, right, which comes from the spine. I just complicated your lives, right? <laughs> Took a very well, so now, no, now I see things are yeah, yeah. So you're gonna start working with her and see. You're gonna watch. You know her hip is tight, so you know you need to already watch for psoas being too tight, pulling on her back. You need to watch for rectus femoris, right, being too tight, also because that can cross the hip and cross the knee. And if she was doing a lot of lunge work, that's typically tight quad front typically tight, you probably want to think about stabi stabilizing that spine a lot so that the hip can start to extend without the back extending as the hip starts to open up, right? And then posterior chain strength, right? To balance the tightness in the front, you need to use those glutes to open up the front. Glutes, hamstrings, yeah? And you don't need to tell her that you're not going to share with her the entire Pilates repertoire. She has never done Pilates. So yeah. She has no idea that you're not going to load her inflection in the meantime, <laughs> right? And as long as she's getting a good workout and she's getting stretched out and she's feeling better, she does not care that she's not getting the whole repertoire, right? No, she was, so, we were doing the arm, the arm pulls on the reformer and she's like, Wow, this is a, or, you know, the, the pulling ropes. And she's like, wow, I'm working up a sweat. Okay. Okay. This is, I'm working up a sweat now. I like this. This is good. This is challenging. Yeah. It's hard. yeah. 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 Awesome. And that's a great, like prone was awesome. Putting her prone, opening up the hip, getting her arms to work and making her feel like she's working hard, which she was, um, is great. That's a great way to hook somebody. Yeah. Because she's getting, she's getting her workout, which she feels like she needs, and you're doing all the right things to keep her safe and to open up the areas that need opening up and not overuse. Yeah, not breaking her pattern. Mm -hmm.